This is my Commodore 1084S that I've had since I was a teenager. It's an incredibly versatile display, and I absolutely love it to pieces. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 39 of Retro Bits. This particular model of 1084 hit the market in 1988 with a retail price of around 300 US, slightly more for the S model. It featured a 13-inch Shadowmask CRT with 640 lines of resolution and a 0.42 millimeter dot pitch. What made this model special is the types of inputs it supports, which we'll take a closer look at in a moment. When I was 11 years old, I started working on the local farm for around $4 an hour. That allowed me to buy my very first Commodore, a 64C. A year later, I traded that 64 up for a used 128. Then I needed an 80-column display, and I picked this up from a local BBS friend, and it was only a year or two old at that point. I used it throughout high school and college, as a TV, and then later with the Amiga for fan subbing. In the early 2000s, it stopped working, so I put it in a closet and basically forgot about it. Just a few years ago, I started getting back into retro computing and reacquired a flat 128 from a local Craigslist seller. Because the 128 requires a special monitor that can display both its 40 and 80 column modes, I dug my broken 1084S out and started doing some research into how I might fix it. The symptoms were a high-pitched whine when it was powered on. Further, there was no high voltage being produced and no picture, not even any static on the screen. I'll get to the repair shortly, but first let's take a look at some of the features that make this display special. This particular model is a 1084 SP. The S means it has stereo speakers, perfect for use with an Amiga, and the P indicates that it was manufactured by Philips. Over the years, Commodore had dozens of different models of displays made by multiple vendors. Between 1987 and 1994, they reused the designation with the 1084D made by Daewoo, as well as the D1 and D2 variants. On the Philips side of the family tree, there were the later P1 and P2 models in addition to the more common version that I own. Each variant had different looks, capabilities, inputs, and controls. Magnavox and Philips sold nearly identical models under their own brand names as well. On the back, we find a variety of inputs, including RCA jacks and a switch for selecting between CVBS, composite video baseband signal, and split Luma Chroma, a precursor to S-Video that is used by both the C64 and 128. Left and right audio inputs are also present on the S model. Moving along, there's a DIN 8 input for digital TTL RGB with intensity, used by the 128's 80-column VDC chip, Tandy 1000, and IBM PCs with CGA. Next to it is a DIN 6 input for analog RGB, used by the Amiga, but compatible with just about everything else from the 16-bit era. Different variants of the 1084 line had unique inputs, some using DIN, others using a standard DE9 connector, and European models having a SCART input. My 1084S ingests analog RGB with separate horizontal and vertical sync, but in testing, I found that it also works fine with systems that only provide composite sync. On North American models, the SCART port is blocked off and no connector is present on the PCB. I'm curious if one can be easily added, so let's take a look at that once we get it opened up. Geometry adjustment knobs are present on the back panel as well, along with a VCR button whose purpose I have never really figured out. This NTSC model has no problem handling 50Hz refresh rates and works perfectly in full color with PAL Amigas when using RGB. However, it's not able to decode the color signal when using Composite or YC, so you'll only get black and white images when using a PAL64. Another nice touch is a hidden kickstand that raises the viewing angle. This is especially handy when the screen is positioned behind an all-in-one system. The hinges on the front panel are a common failure point. In fact, mine were already broken when I bought it in 1990. Here in the present day, repairs are trivial with a 3D printed part courtesy of Thingiverse. Inside the front panel are your typical color, brightness, and volume controls, along with a button to switch between the RGB and composite or YC inputs. So having dug my old 1084S out of the closet, I started doing some research on the internet. 
From what I read, the high-pitched whine I was hearing was the power supply going into overload protection, a symptom of a failed flyback transformer. As it turns out, this is one of the most common failure modes on these monitors, along with cracked solder joints at the base of the flyback. Armed with just enough knowledge to be dangerous, I was able to source a new old stock replacement part. I also replaced all of the capacitors as well as the horizontal output transistor, which tends to self-destruct when the flyback fails. To my surprise, after replacing all of these parts, the monitor sprang to life looking as good as the day it was made. I've been happily using it ever since. That was about two years ago now. Since then, the 1084S has been a staple on RetroBits going back to the very first episode. Of course, when I purchased it as a child, I had no idea it would be this useful or versatile. Since being repaired, it's been an absolute workhorse, displaying every 8 and 16-bit system I could throw at it, with a beautifully sharp image and vivid colors. It's also the only CRT I have that properly syncs with the Apple IIgs's RGB output, something the Sony PVM won't even do properly. Fast forward to today. Here I am making a video on why I love this monitor and how great it is. Then suddenly, and without warning, things start to go off the rails. Ah, the joys of working with vintage hardware. Houston, we have a problem. Looks like I'm going to have to pivot a bit and rework the script from this point forward. A tribute video has suddenly turned into a troubleshooting and repair video instead. Well, let's roll with the punches and get this thing opened up once again. Five screws on the back and the cover pops right off. Also be careful to disconnect the speaker harness. Per Adrian Black's sage wisdom, this monitor has certainly seen some action, as evidenced by the amount of buildup here. The usual warning applies. Working on CRTs can be dangerous, so don't attempt repairs unless you know what you're doing. Also be advised that I am not in any way, shape, or form an expert in this area. I'm learning as I go, and by showing you my process, including all of my mistakes, I hope that we both come away from this exercise a little smarter. With the board removed, we can see all the work that I previously performed, including the new flyback and all the new capacitors. My first inclination is to look for anything obvious, a smoking gun if you will. I'll inspect the board for damaged components, leakage, and evidence of arcing or burning. The only thing that jumped out immediately was this beefy 2 watt resistor connected to the base of the horizontal output transistor. It appears the casing is cracked, but it tested out alright. I'll replace it as a precaution, but we need to dig deeper. Fortunately, this model only has a single RF shield. It's soldered in place in a number of spots along the ground plane, and several of those areas have previously lifted from the PCB. Removing it isn't too bad, but it's attached to the power supply and the neck board by relatively short soldered grounds, which is a nuisance. When I repaired this monitor before, it was one of the first projects I had undertaken on my retro computing journey. I only had an old $15 Radio Shack soldering iron and lacked experience at the time. As a result, some of my work was, let's say, subpar. Since I'm in here, I want to clean things up using proper equipment and an improved technique in order to eliminate bad joints as a contributing factor. These aren't the droids we're looking for, but I can't see this helping anything either.
I don't know if this ground wire failed before or after I took the monitor apart, but it looks awfully crusty, so I'm going to replace it with some 14 gauge braided speaker wire I had lying around. As a bonus, I get to play with my new desoldering gun again too. I'll solder in the new wire later, but for now I'm glad to be replacing it. This corrosion can't have been helping things. While the desoldering gun is out, I'm going to remove the horizontal output transistor. The part was replaced previously, but I suspect it could have been damaged. You see, when I first installed it, I didn't know that a mica or silicone thermally conductive insulator was required. Without one, the transistor shorts out against the heatsink. My thought is it could have been damaged, and since it's only a $2 part, it can't hurt to replace it. I've also heard that feeding the monitor a 31 kHz signal could also cause damage, and that's something I've certainly done before by accident with some Mr. FPGA cores. Here's that damaged resistor. I've added a replacement to my DigiKey cart. While poking around online, I found this service bulletin that indicates a number of discrete components that are prone to failure when the flyback goes out. Since my original flyback did fail, it seems like cheap insurance to make sure these get replaced, so into the shopping cart they go. One horizontal output transistor, a bunch of replacement resistors, as well as a handful of film capacitors. I also snuck in a part I need for an upcoming repair video. Being ever the optimist, I figured there was a good chance of getting the monitor working again, so I started investigating the SCART header on the main PCB. It looks promising. All the necessary pins appear to be connected, so I went ahead and ordered a 90 degree female SCART connector from Console 5 for another couple of bucks. If I can get this to work, it'll make the monitor even more accessible by allowing me to connect computers and consoles using off-the-shelf cables instead of custom making each one. With the replacement parts installed, it's time to check on our progress. I reconnected all of the boards back up on the bench and made ready to flip the switch. Well, that's not what I wanted to hear. It sounds like arcing. I also saw a puff of smoke. But from where? Let me disconnect the deflection yoke and test again. Whoa, we have high voltage again. We're closing in on it now. Some more poking around and contorting myself into odd shapes and we have our smoking gun. Literally, in this case. See the copper windings that comprise the deflection yoke? They're supposed to be this color. Now look down here. It's hard to photograph from this angle, but the wire is burnt and charred, a sure sign of a short. So, why did it fail? Well, probably just age. Over many heat cycles, the insulation can break down. 
The high frequencies also cause physical resonance, further stressing the material. Can it be fixed? Well, repair of the yoke is beyond my current level of skill. Maybe I can find a used replacement from a donor, but even those will eventually fail, which is the destiny of all CRTs, unfortunately. So that's where we are right now. I am pretty bummed because I've had this most of my life and it is such a great display. I'm not giving up on it yet, but finding replacement parts is going to be a challenge. I'm also not going to be able to show you the SCART upgrade I had planned for it. Well, let's not dwell on the negative. It's time to recap. No, not like that. Why I love the Commodore 1084S. First, the aesthetics. Maybe it's just me, but I love the design. I guess I just prefer the hard angles over the more rounded variants. It pairs perfectly with just about any system of the era. Further, it won't yellow since the plastic is painted. Also, the built-in stand is a nice touch. Next, the image is crisp and clear and the colors are vivid, even after many years of hard use. With composite, Lumachroma, digital RGBI, and analog RGB, this monitor can accept just about any signal from any console or computer of the day, as long as it's 15 kHz. In addition to the supported inputs, it also handles RGB with HVSync as well as C-Sync, and even works great with the Apple II GS, something none of my other displays can claim to do. And finally, I've had this thing since I was barely a teenager, and it has performed exceptionally with every task I've asked of it over the last 30 years. I barely knew what it was capable of when I bought it, but I've been continually surprised as an adult. Okay, so nothing is perfect, and there are a few drawbacks. First is that the screen is oh so curved. A Trinitron this is not. It has a kind of retro charm to it, but after decades of flat panel displays, it's quite the reminder of an era gone by. As a CRT from the 80s, there are no digital controls or stored profiles. You have to manually adjust the screen settings for each different input you want to use, and there's no service menu or on-screen display. Because it's a computer monitor, there's no RF input or built-in TV tuner. It worked amazingly well as a small TV, but you'd have needed a cable box or a VCR to get the most out of it. The power switch on all of the similar models tended to fail over time. Fortunately, new parts are still available, for now. And that brings us to the very last point. Replacement parts are getting harder and harder to find. Flybacks and deflection yokes eventually fail, and someday there simply won't be any new old stock left to buy. CRTs were not made to last forever. So my advice is to enjoy them while you can. So there we have it, why I love the Commodore 1084S. I really do want to save this display, so if you have any suggestions on how to fix or replace the yoke, please do let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. <music>